And how you guys doing? Welcome to the show. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the Queen of Meth. Yes, this broad was making a ton of money. I think it was estimated at $200,000 per week. And that is Lori Arnold and her connections to the Grim Reapers motorcycle club in the 1980s and tomorrow we got maurice boucher the hell's angels up in canada's leader of the nomads chapter and he was one of the influential ones doing during the uh, quebec war uh, then we got, uh, actually, the Quebec War coming up after that. Then we got uh, the 10 most influential motorcycle clubs in the scene. Again, don't forget uh, to like and subscribe to the video. Hit pound rock on. Yes, that is pound rock on. Uh, we're going to be continuing our little history bit here. And Lori Arnold, there is now a Discovery Channel series on her, I believe. Or maybe it's an hour-long deal. I have no idea. But one thing is for sure, this sucker made a lot of money. A lot of money on meth. And methamphetamines has been associated with some of the hardcore 1% clubs since the 70s and 80s. You know, that's really the high time for them. Now it's mostly the Mexican drug cartels that have that type of control on the drug trade with that methamphetamines. That's because it's harder and harder in the United States to find the ingredients to cook it. And I think that's why it moved over the border. But it's because of the past and the actions of some of the guys in the clubs to make their money that law enforcement has really targeted them and put a bullseye on clubs that in the past were involved with this kind of stuff. They can't forget the past, man. They really can't, and that's a sad state of affairs because now it's a rare type of deal where you see entire chapters getting busted for this stuff. Yes, it's still uh, in the scene, but not as much as it used to be. And it's time to let go, feds. It really is. Uh, it was funny. In 1990, there was a special report on 60 Minutes about this. And they just blew it up, man. Uh, it just showed how the thinking was back then against 1% clubs. As soon as they made it uh, on 60s Minutes, uh, they made it, I can tell you that. Uh, I was going to show you the video, but it'll probably get flagged by YouTube as being copyrighted because now all these mainstream media companies are copywriting their crap. And it's a sad state of affairs because, you know, other people like to see it that might not watch the channel. So, but it's a 60 minutes special report, The Hells, Angels, and Meth. And it's from the 1990s, if you want to take a look at it. And it really gives a background on how clubs were associated with this kind of stuff back in the day. Now, are they still associated with it? You know, maybe, maybe not. Like I said, the cops never let anything go any damn way, so uh, they'll keep on pushing that side of the business on the clubs, even though it's the Mexican dr uh, drug cartels that are actually producing the stuff. Uh, but they'll always say, hey, the clubs are selling at this, the clubs are selling at that. That's just like when the clubs do do good fundraising stuff, 
the cops always come back, and this is something they do all the time, and say, well, they're just covering up for their illegal activities. you got a guy who is actually on YouTube that preaches the biker revolution. It's funny, how the hell are you going to have a cop, an active duty cop, try to push something like that? It just makes them seem retarded. But what's even worse is the people that follow them. The people that actually believe in the crap that he's pushing. I've always found that really weird that you got these, you know, supposed hardcore bikers following a cop. Attitudes have really changed over time as far as law enforcement's concerned. And like I've, you know, I just did an interview with uh, Crime Media. And we were talking about the case of Rodriguez uh, out in California where the SWAT team busted down the door. And they busted down the door because he was a member of the Mongols, for one. And two, it was a no-knock warrant. So, of course, if somebody's coming and busting down your door and you don't know who they are, they don't announce who they are, yeah, you're going to blow them away. Especially, especially if you have family in that house that you have to be afraid of them getting hurt. So, yeah, you're going to blast them away. So we kind of talked about that case, and we talked about also, and I made sure I brought this up in that interview, that the cops talk so bad about motorcycle clubs, but they'll go out looking exactly like the people they don't like. And I'm talking about the patches, they're even wearing rockers, designating their territory and it is funny that a lot of these police departments that they work with they don't do nothing about it yeah they'll say well our department's not happy about us being involved in something like this but they never do anything there's been incidences in Chicago where these police clubs or law enforcement clubs go into bars, cause all kinds of problems, and when the citizens start fighting back, because they don't know they're cop clubs, man, they pull their badges out. So what's that tell you about that person and who he is and what he believes in? I don't get why, you know... The law enforcement clubs, and we'll get into uh, the Queen of Meth and stuff like that, but this is kind of a backstory on this stuff of the way they keep on bringing up the past with some of these clubs with this meth deal, but they're out there trying to mimic them. And I'd really wish that this one creator would actually sit down and explain If he's starting a biker revolution, then why the hell are you looking identical to these clubs that you're bashing? You're wearing a three-piece patch. You're claiming territory. You can't have it both ways. And what's even more concerning is a lot of these law enforcement clubs have been popping up all over the place, man. They're the new pop-up deal, as I call it, man. You know, back in the early 2000s, uh, uh, shit, around 2008 and more, you had a lot of citizen pop-up clubs. Now these law enforcement clubs are really popping up, man. I get it. Everybody enjoys riding a motorcycle. But you don't have to be a hypocrite in your beliefs. So when you go and say that MCs, the 1% dominance, which have changed a hell of a lot, let me tell you, since the 70s and 80s when all this stuff was going down. 
you say because they're doing good for their community that that's a cover-up. Well, what's it mean when you're acting like something you want to bust? That nobody's ever gave an answer to. And I don't think you're ever going to get an answer from these people on why they feel like they deserve to wear something like that. You, I, you know what? One of the reasons why I started the history deal is hopefully people can start distinguishing between the real deals and the ones that ain't so real. Because there's a lot of clubs nowadays that are just throwing on 1% diamonds. And what's even more concerning is you got some of these old school storied 1% clubs actually giving them the 1% diamond. And I guess where I'm coming from is with all the history that some of these clubs went through and what they had to do to just give it away, I think their brothers would be rolling around in the graves, don't you? Uh, when I talk about the 10 most influential motorcycle clubs later on this week, you'll see one's missing. And the reason why one's missing even though they had hardcore beginnings, they had to play the game, they did what they had to do, they lost brothers to jail or to grave, but in present days, they went freaking ape shit, man. They went crazy. And it's my understanding some of them within the club don't like the direction, but it is what it is. You know, how could you go from a storied MC to like a pop-up club? It's something I don't understand. Maybe uh, the culture has changed a little bit. Maybe it's time to evolve, yeah. But seeing a major go like that within the top five to like a pop-up type of deal is beyond me. Handing out patches to clubs, anybody who wants a diamond they get. Flipping people that a lot of people in the scene can't stand. You know, I was talking about that, uh, I don't know, last week or the week before. You have a lot of people that bump on Iron Order, call them a cop club, uh, all that kind of stuff, which may or may not be true. I don't, you know what? I don't get into that internal stuff. But one thing I do know is you have this one major club flipping entire chapters. Again, entire chapters of the Iron Order. So what's that say about the club that used to be a hardcore dominant? And what's that say to their supporters that, say, a week beforehand, before all this happened, were banging on the Iron Order? And now you have people supporting those chapters that were flipped from Iron Order. See, the hypocrisy in the scene is something else, man. I really tell you, it is something else. It's like things don't stay straight and narrow, if you will. I've done uh, some videos the last two days where it talked about property of patches and it talked about if women are equal to men in the scene. And by God, did I hear an earful, man. It's like, you know what? You're a dinosaur. You're a chauvinistic pig. And this was coming from freaking so-called hardcore bikers. I was like, what the hell happened to your balls? It, like, freaked me out. I, it really did freak me out, that thinking. Not so much on the property of patch and if, you know, non-1% clubs should be wearing them because, in all honesty, that's where it started out. You know, people learned some different things about it uh, where, in the 50s, women actually wore a 
patch, their own man was equivalent to, meaning if he was a probate or a full club member stuff. And then it looks like in the 60s, not for sure, is when uh, the property of stuff started, you know, out because the two different uh, philosophies between the 50s and the 60s. So, yes, it does have a hypocritical type of deal, and it's hard for people to keep up, that I know, uh, between uh, bikers now supporting this biker revolution with cops in charge of it, to major 1% clubs handing out the diamond. So hopefully the history is, you know, being distinguished right here on this channel. And the discussions have been pretty good, man. The discussions in the comment section, the emails you send, everybody's really liking that stuff. Again, uh, the biker news stuff, uh, harleyliberty.com, you check that out. It's always up to date. It's the most up to date site uh, on the internet about what's going on the scene. Uh, and yes, I'll be doing some of that, uh, but I really like doing the, the history stuff and hopefully to get people thinking. Too often are people interested in just chatter. They want to go along with everybody else and they don't want to think for themselves. So that's one of the major reasons why I put out subjects that make you think. And this is all old stuff, I get it. But for new people coming into the scene, they never know about these events unless they were actually told by somebody. Like a gray beard. Oh, this was the days. This is what happened. They wouldn't know all this stuff. And the new Jacks couldn't understand why somebody would get upset with them just throwing a patch on because their club went through this stuff where yours didn't. Now, when there's a pop-up club, they don't follow tradition or blessings or any of that type of stuff. That's because they don't want a prospect. It's It just comes down to that. They don't want a prospect. They don't want to put in the hard work. And what's more concerning is that when they do eventually say, okay, let's go do it right way, they're throwing stuff that people bled for, died for. It just doesn't make any sense to me, and I guess it never will. So let me know your thoughts in the description box, and I'll show you real quick what I was talking about here. Uh, this is the 1990 special report, uh, with 60 minutes. I'm not going to play it. <coughs> Sorry about that. But just so you to see where it's at. Anyway, now, we're going to concentrate on Lori Arnold. She has a program, like I mentioned earlier, on the Discovery Plus, I think it is, where she was the queen of meth, man. This broad was making a lot of money with her old man, uh, Floyd Stockdale, who was a chapter president for the Grim Reapers. Now, there is all kinds back then of clubs called the Grim Reapers, so it might not be the one of today, uh... I didn't get that far. You know, I know there was an Iowa chapter of the Grim Reapers where he was, uh, but we'll look more into it as we go through this article. And again, his name was Floyd Stockdale. And he had a kid. And, you know, if you don't, guys don't know who Lori Arnold is, that's uh, Tom Arnold's sister, so you guys know. Uh, you know, the one that... Uh, Mikhail's Navy, Sons of Anarchy, played that porn old dude. Uh, so, anyway, 
Let's read a couple paragraphs here. Lori Arnold's thriving drug enterprise in the Midwest came tumbling down in 91. She uh, operated out of Iowa with her then-husband, Floyd Stockdale. The couple went on to make tremendous amount of money through the course of six years that they were active before arrested and uh, convicted. Queen of Meth, now that's the, the deal on Discovery+. Plus. It chronicles the life and the downfall of the drug operation and Loria's relationship with Floyd. One thing I never understood is these people making all this money and they don't put it aside or they don't hide it in case they get caught. Don't know. Anyway, who is Floyd Stockdale? He was a Vietnam veteran. Hardcore boys, man, the Vietnam veterans, man. I talk about it all the time, how hardcore they were, how uh, they really led the way uh, for the 1% clubs you see today. He joined the Grim Reapers Motorcycle uh, Club at some point after his return, which a lot of people did. They As soon as they got back from Vietnam, they were joining clubs because they missed that camaraderie. And the culture back then with uh, the 60s and 70s and everybody hating on uh, vets, yeah, they wanted to be outside of society and do their thing. Uh, he eventually came uh, president. He met Lori when she was just 18 years old. Uh, according to them, the motorcycle club at that point was heavily involved in smuggling drugs and guns. Uh, they don't put any sources for that down in this article. I'd wish they'd put the sources that make that kind of statement. Floyd and Lori started dating and eventually got married in 1980. Uh, he was in his mid-30s, so uh, high five, man, getting yourself an 18-year-old at 30 years old. Uh, and she was attached to him like a lot of women, if you listen to the, prop or the Property Up video, because of the power that he held and the respect that he commanded. Uh, there's a picture of him right there, and again, this is cin um, what is it, cinematic... Uh, Cinematoholic or something like that. I guess everybody loves freaking movies. I don't know. Uh, they had a kid together uh, in 81. A few years into their marriage, Lori's first uh, thrust with meth was when Floyd's brother Mike introduced her to it. And meth is a bad drug, man. I'm telling you. Me, I'm a 420 guy. I never understood why anybody goes over a 420. Uh, yeah, take a line of coke here and there to keep you up for the weekend or something when you're on a long ride. Uh, but meth, man, you start getting into a damn freaking uh, business, nasty business there, man, when you get involved in that stuff. I'm sure that everybody's seen the before and after pictures of some of the meth users. Sad state of affairs, man. Uh, sad state of affairs. It was in 85 that she started this six-year-long wild ride of drug trafficking and manufacturing. Uh, they were making a lot of money. Uh, now, they go on to say that Lori was the brains behind the organization. Uh, he Floyd was more of the intimidating muscle. Which, you know what? People might not admit it, but women, if you have a good woman behind you, man, you can go anywhere you want. It's when you don't have a good woman behind you, you start getting messed up. And that's one of the reasons why women really ain't allowed or supposed to be allowed in some stuff like that, man. I, you know, Because you, when you have a woman with a kid and the feds come knocking and they start using that, kid against them yeah they're gonna open up real quick real quick uh now they i guess they did launder the money through multiple businesses and even invested in racing horses not me you know stick that money in belize somewhere uh it did fall in 91 uh after a solid case against them uh, at the time of the arrest, they had a property worth over seven hundred fifty thousand. Uh, Floyd and Lori were both charged with a multitude of offenses that included criminal uh, enterprise, gun viola uh, violations. Uh, how did he die? Now he died in nineteen or what is it? He was 
Well, he was, uh, he pled guilty in 93, sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison. Uh, at his sentencing, he said, I got into this accidentally. I'm sorry I had to break the law to support my family, which a lot of people nowadays are forced to do. That's one story these cops won't tell you or these media programs is it's hard to make it in this world now without freaking having a good job and those that don't are forced onto the streets to make that money to survive. Maybe uh, stop with the stupid, uh, you know, political this and that and let people work instead of tearing down pipelines and stuff like that. Uh, he died of a heart attack in 2004 while being incarcerated at Leavenworth. So he was at Leavenworth, man. It's no joke over in Leavenworth. Uh, and he was just a few months away from release on parole. Sad stuff, man. Now, here is Lori Arnold. This was the queen of meth. And they ask, where is she now? Uh, it goes through the story I just went through. Uh, she was born to Jack and uh, Linda in 61. She had two brothers, Tom and Scott. Her parents divorced when she was about three. Uh, and Linda was given uh, initial custody. She quickly turned them over to their father, Jack. Lori grew up in a religious household. Jack married their neighbor, Ruth, and they had two children of their own apart from uh, the two uh, Ruth had. That's just a little uh, background on her. In 80, Lori got married to local biker Floyd Stockdale. Uh, they talk about the Grim Reapers again. Now, where it didn't continue from the previous one was Mike introduced Lori to the meth. After she tried it, Mike handed over some and asked her to sell it. Once she got rid of the product quickly, Lori saw a lucrative opportunity to get out of poverty. And that's what a lot of people do, man. Again, they go to the streets, get out of poverty. Uh, and it began. It quickly spread within the city and there was always demand for more. Uh, she was introduced to a drug trafficker in California who was involved with the Mexican cartel. You know, you got to watch the Mexican cartels, man. It, it, it's a whole different level and a whole different story. Uh, they were buying meth from them and hauling it into Iowa. She began to make a lot of money. She bought a bar, a horse ranch, multiple other properties. Uh, the idea was to set up business with that money, but it was hard to give up selling. To add to that, she was using meth. You know, once you get high on your own supply, man, you get all whacked out and, you know what, your business mind goes to hell. Uh, when one of her drivers was caught making the trip back from California, she set up her own meth lab, earning even more profits. Uh, at the height of the operation, uh, she was the primary supplier for multiple states surrounding Iowa, and her drug empire was uh, swarming. Uh, then uh, 91 came, she was sentenced to uh, the 15 years, she was released in 1999, uh, by then uh, the meth epidemic, which is still now, man, it's still happening now with the epidemic, uh, ravaged the city. Uh, she was released from prison in 2007, she moved to Arizona after that. Uh, her friends and family ended up, uh, getting addicted to meth, so uh, state of affairs, selling it to your family. But she left that meth, would have, uh, crossed over to the Midwest even without her empire, so she, uh, you know, tried to, uh, say, yeah, you know, if I didn't do it, somebody else would. Uh, actually, a quote from her was, any kind of drugs are always going to show up. I never wanted to hurt anyone. It was all clean fun back then, and it's how it felt at the moment. You know, she is an avid biker. She rides her own trike, it looks like. Uh, she When she went to Arizona, she met her fiancé. Uh, then they moved to his hometown of Ohio. The drug trafficking days are truly behind them. Now, Tom Arnold, I wanted to get some, uh, you know, of his thoughts on that. Uh, I needed to feel alive, she says. The biggest thing for him was she didn't want her ended up murdered. 
which in that business can happen. There's some pictures of her. Uh, I don't like that I'm getting old, she uh, chuckles. I've had a lot of downs, but I was able to pull out and survive it. You know, that's kind of the backstory of her. Uh, again, you can see all that stuff on this Discovery Plus deal. So go take a look at it. Very interesting story. It's very interesting that she was the brains behind the operation. And here it is, Tom Arnold's freaking uh, sister. Uh, you know, the Tom Arnold with Roseanne and Sons of Anarchy. Real, <laughs> real messed up stuff. But it also goes to show you that there are, you know, there is somewhat justice in this country. But I don't think... Tom Arnold was real popular back when all this went down. So I might be mistaken, but I don't think he was. I don't think he had, uh, you know, the power to like a lot of these freaking stars do where they never go to jail because of who they are and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe the video and join us all this week, man. We're going to have a fun time going through this type of stuff. Uh, I'm heading over right now to MotorcycleMadhouseRadio.com. We continue to about uh, 930 a.m. Central Standard Time. Have all kinds of fun. So I'll talk to you guys later if you don't go over there.